I was standing in the middle of Red Square, my first trip ever to the Soviet Union, and I suddenly had a flashback to 36 years earlier when I was in Washington. I was sitting in the bar after a day of having poured over aerial photographs of Moscow, Red Square in particular. And then I kept thinking about the results of the work I was doing in the morning, drawing these circles centered on Red Square and finding that even a very big uh, nuclear weapon that I was then working on at Los Alamos was not enough to destroy all of Moscow. I was dis disappointed, I was morose that my bomb, and that's the way I thought of it, wouldn't kill everybody in Moscow. So I came back to the present, looked around, and saw these people milling around, happy looking, and I just lost emotional control, started sobbing. I now have flashbacks to that moment at Red Square, and I get very emotional. I feel that way right now. The bombs are really horrible. And seeing people in a place where I was trying to kill them, trying to think of how they could be killed, was just too much. Can the awesome power of the atom ever be safely harnessed? It's a debate that won't go away even as Ontario Hydro announces record losses and closes reactors. You may think that means nuclear power is on its way out, but it's been pronounced dead before, and you may be in for a big surprise. From early on, the nuclear industry went to great lengths to separate the warlike atom from the friendly atom. Well, what new fangled atomic firecracker are you working on now? Now, Pat, you know we don't work on things like that. Sure, Doc. We're putting them atoms to work for us. That's right. But you know something? Sometimes it's darn hard for me to convince myself that that's the way it is. This interactive exhibit at British Nuclear Fuels' Sellafield facility is one of the most popular tourist attractions in the north of England. As their spokespeople make clear, they're not just in the power business, but also in the business of selling an idea. The nuclear industry uh, has historically been seen as a secret industry, uh, and we recognize that's something we do have to work on. Uh, we have a policy of openness now, we have built the Sellafield Visitors Centre. We get 150,000 visitors a year, and we also take them on tours around the site. And that's to try and remove some of this historic secrecy that surrounds us. It may have been born in the secrecy of war, but in Canada, as everywhere, the era of the friendly atom was heralded with evangelical enthusiasm. The first half of this century saw a development which made it unique in history. Man learned to fly. During the second half of the century, we're probably going to reach the moon. But I think even more fantastic. We're going to harness the unlimited energy of matter itself in nuclear power. About 2,500 years ago, the Greek thinker Democritus said, the world is made up of tiny, indivisible particles, atoms. It was just over a century ago that he was proved wrong. 
atoms are not indivisible. 1930 was the year that Grant Wood painted American Gothic. Bonnie met Clyde, and the photo flash came into use. And the Nazis gained 107 seats in the German elections. By the mid-30s, scientists had found a number of ways to probe the structure of the atom. It was 1938, and radio ruled. On the eve of war, German scientists demonstrated that it is possible to split the nucleus, and the race to master this energy began in earnest. By a strange trick of fate, the ruthless dictator and Charlie resemble each other like two peas in a pod. Does this remind you of anything? Chaplin mocked Hitler, even as Europe started to fall before the Nazi blitzkrieg. In 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Britain and France responded, and the Second World War began. Early on in the war, Canada became a key center for nuclear research and joined the British and Americans in the development of the first atomic bombs. It was an enterprise that moved ahead with surprising speed. It was only about six months from the first test explosion to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In 1953, U.S. President Eisenhower gave a speech at the U.N. calling for the beating of atomic swords into nuclear plowshares, and the friendly atom took to the public stage. Against the dark background of the atomic bomb, the United States does not wish merely to present strength, but also the desire and the hope for peace, a special purpose would be to provide abundant electrical energy in the power-starved areas of the world. Thus, the contributing powers would be dedicating some of their strength to serve the needs rather than the fears of mankind. At that time, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, science and technology were on a pedestal. You know, the whole public uh, uh, was behind it, uh, they were benefiting from it, uh, air travel was growing, uh, uh, television was uh, turning from a shaky old black and white picture into uh, good color and all of these sorts of things. Science and technology were king. And you could do almost anything, you know, there were no boundaries. Uh, you could go out and develop and invent things and uh, chances are there'd be a market for it and the public would want it. And as yours and Eve's needs increase, the investor-owned electric companies that gave you Connecticut Yankee will investigate even further the most modern concepts of the People day. People were so impressed with science. They were so impressed with power. They were so impressed with just the sheer technological exuberance of this industry that, uh, that they blinded themselves to all the problems. They simply said, well, we'll get around to fixing that later, but look, look at what this can do. The superpower which man has released from within the atom's heart is not one, but many giants. One is the warrior. I think it's a question of having a mistaken perception, which is mythical in nature, as to what this industry is capable of. Another is the farmer helping to better feed tomorrow's world. Still another is the healer, helping to diagnose and cure the sick. What's the matter? I've been wondering if all this is worth it. What are you talking about? It kind of discourages me about finishing my course at Tech. But George, what does? This. Oh, oh, I see. But don't you think that this writer was just a bit hysterical? It's time for the news at 7 in Tabloid.
Canada came out of the war with nuclear expertise as well as uranium mines. Outside of the U.S., it had the world's only nuclear reactor. Atomic power promised a future where everything seemed possible, from atomic jets to nuclear toasters. It was a new and little understood technology that was introduced without much debate, or even a recognition that public debate might be important. We should have recognized the potential for the industry to be misunderstood and perhaps put more effort into uh, telling the public what we were doing, why we were doing it, how we were doing it, uh, and all of these sorts of things. Instead, we were just sort of caught up in the uh, excitement of the time, and uh, uh, we just didn't pay attention to that. It was 1953, the year that Queen Elizabeth II was crowned and Stalin died. The Cold War was already in full swing. Over the next decade, experimental reactors would test the elements that would later become part of the unique Canadian nuclear system, the CAN-DO. While remaining a leader in research, Canada would not be the first to use nuclear power to make electricity on a commercial scale. Great Britain was the first country in the world to embark upon a full-scale nuclear power program. The Calder Hall design forms the basis of the present British program. The moderator used to slow down the neutrons is graphite, of which Britain has ample supplies. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall, Britain's first atomic power station. Using the heat from nuclear reactions to drive steam turbines, Calder Hall became home to the world's first commercial nuclear power reactor. While the industry may have been wrapped in secrecy, the experimental reactor at Chalk River attracted some unwanted attention when Canada attained a record of its own and became the site of the world's first nuclear accident. While the accident may have caught the industry and the public both off guard, official reassurances soon calmed things down. This first accident did nothing to slow down our still infant industry. In fact, within a few years, we had given a similar experimental reactor to India. It was a gift that some feared would lead to the proliferation of weapons and the escalation of the risk of nuclear conflict. It was the 1960s were to become a decade of protest and change. It was a difficult time for an industry that was not used to such scrutiny and criticism. Why would you extend that? Just watch me. In 1972, Canada was victorious in the first Canada-Soviet hockey series. Well, I'm not a crook. By 1973, the Vietnam War ended. A year later, in the famous Rumble in the Jungle, Ali defeated Foreman to recapture the heavyweight championship. In November of 74, Karen Silkwood died. She had worked for a plutonium fuel factory and was an outspoken critic of the industry's safety record. Her suspicious death led to accusations of murder and cover-up. It was just another blow to the industry that year. In 1974, Canada supplied India with another reactor, this time a power reactor. Meanwhile, the experimental reactors we had given earlier were not lying idle. An underground explosion shook the Rajasthan desert of India. And with it, that country became the sixth nation on Earth to have exploded a nuclear device, a bomb. The Indian Canada may terminate its program of nuclear cooperation with India because of that country's underground nuclear test last it's week. It's been known for some time that Indian scientists have had the sophisticated knowledge necessary for a nuclear explosion. Very concerned with uh, the explosion. It is certainly contrary to our understanding of our aid to them, which I always specified would never be in terms of having any explosion. When the Canadians 
expressed dismay over the Indians exploding their first bomb in 1974, there was more than a little hypocrisy here because they had given Indians a carbon copy of the NRX reactor, which is the very reactor that we were producing plutonium in and selling to the Americans for bombs. So in fact, the Indians simply used the reactor that we gave them in exactly the same way that we had used the original reactor, plutonium for bombs. The economic boom that began at the end of World War II continued. Automobiles, new subdivisions, and factories all demanded energy. And nuclear promised someday to be safe, clean, and cheap. So this growing energy market in general, and Southern Ontario in particular, seems to be ready for a new source of low-cost power. And if nuclear energy ever becomes cheap enough, it will be the answer. We can be sure of one thing today. The world has been unalterably changed by the discovery that the atom can be harnessed for public power. We in Canada, like people everywhere, are committed to some kind of nuclear future. And that future comes closer every day. Southern Ontario was to become the atomic center of Canada. Over the next 30 years, nuclear was going to come to supply 60% of the province's electricity. Throughout the building of Atomic Ontario, there were growing concerns that the nuclear industry was being less than candid about risks costs, and benefits. The 70s brought more than disco. It brought the army to the streets of Montreal as Prime Minister Trudeau declared the War Measures Act. 1978 started off with a bang when a nuclear-powered Soviet satellite crashed into Canada, spreading radioactive debris across thousands of square kilometers. July 1979, witnessed the largest nuclear spill in U.S. history when a waste pond from a uranium mine collapsed in New Mexico. But before that, the world would be shocked by a series of accidents. And that was only the beginning. ...from a nuclear reactor has forced the shutdown of part of the Pickering Generating Station just east of Toronto. This was just... Uh, uh, a very, very minute leak. Plant officials admit a similar radiation accident took Still place two years ago. Reactor cool, and everything is under control. There's no risk to uh, anybody. But this weekend's accidents are just three more in a growing list One of One mis mysterious accident after another, all summer long. The latest trouble happened on the Labor Day weekend. Sound operating plants. They operate amongst the best in the world. <laughs> it's always a minor accident. It's always nothing to alarm the public. It's always contained and controlled. Officials say the chance of an explosion are remote, but they do say that the worst that could happen is an accident that would kill 45,000 people and spread contamination. Nuclear power the has the best safety record of any energy industry going. Within the Western world, there's only been one significant accident, Three Mile Island, and not a member of the public was hurt. Well, you had about as catastrophic an accident as you could wish for in Chernobyl. You know, that's one uh, where the reactor uh, core was exposed and all of the radioactivity was escaping into the atmosphere. The only casualties at the time were workers who went up there to try to put the fires out. Now, there were a significant number of people exposed to radiation from that, but the Reports that I've seen from international health experts uh, say that there's no negative health impact from that except for some thyroid cancers, and thyroid cancer is curable. So the actual public uh, harm caused from Chernobyl uh, is not uh, very large, even though that was a disaster of an accident. 
tons of radioactive fuel escaped as fallout from Chernobyl Unit 4. For those who received large doses of radiation, the consequences were immediate and obvious. For hundreds of kilometers around Chernobyl, the seeming tranquility of village life masks a darker reality. Even in communities that received less than a gram of fallout, food had to be imported, and children kept in their classrooms for 12 hours a day to minimize their exposure to radiation. Outdoor play had to be limited to areas where the contaminated soil has been removed and replaced. In the fashion we have come to expect in this debate, some nuclear proponents report minimal consequences from this accident, while critics claim the effects have been catastrophic. How can there possibly be so much controversy surrounding what seems to be a straightforward question? In part, it depends what you choose to count as consequences. Anybody knows that a hazard that causes a fatal cancer also causes non-fatal cancers. Uh, what uh, happens when you choose fatal cancer, this is an in administrative decision, you choose it as your endpoint, is you neglect cancers like um, skin cancer, thyroid cancer, and breast cancer, which are not uniformly fatal, uh, so that uh, you, you uh, allow yourself to cause more of the non-fatal cancers, and, but that's not part of your regulatory system. By the mid-70s, the Watergate scandal shocked the world. In Canada, the government froze both prices and wages. Institutions formerly treated as sacred were now being questioned as never before. By 1976, it wasn't only accidents. Scandals also tarnished the industry's image. The success of can-do sales abroad was tainted by accusations of bribery and corruption. Critics said the reactors sold only because the sales were subsidized with tax dollars. The industry, once respected and admired, watched itself being questioned, mocked, and caricatured. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. Uh, hello, D hello, Dimitri. This is Jack Goodell. We have a serious condition. You get everybody into safety areas and make sure that they stay there. Uh, I suppose that's normal background radiation, the kind you'd find in any well-maintained nuclear facility, or for that matter, playgrounds and hospitals. We've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. Plutonium rod used as paperweight. Oh, now that shouldn't be. The toilet kill me. Yeah, well, it's always been like that. I think both sides of the the polarized debate have called each other names over over the years. Uh, uh, it's too bad. Uh, I think the industry. Uh, I will say that I think the industry was very um, calm in its response initially until it got so frustrated with some of the tactics of the activists that it lashed out a bit, and uh, perhaps the level of the debate went down uh, at that point. The debate reached a new low when in 1988, activists held a press conference to announce that Atomic Energy Canada Limited, the AECL, had been spying on them. A 43-page document was prepared for AECL and assesses the strengths and weaknesses of 20 environmental groups. The environmentalists charged that people pretending to be reporters obtained information about them for AECL. This dossier had been assembled by a gentleman who was hired by AECL to do so. And his modus operandi was to go around and visit the group saying that he was a reporter for Harold Smith magazine or for some other magazine and that they wanted to do a kind of a public interest story on environmental groups, and uh, could he have the pleasure of some interviews? But they identified about 20 organizations they thought were anti-nuclear, including the Physicians Against Nuclear War, the Energy Probe, 
our organization, the International Institute for Public Health, uh, CELA, the Canadian Environmental Law Association. I mean, all these people were on the list. AECL spokesman Ian Mumford says there was nothing illegal about the way the information was gathered. We're not spying at all. Uh, what we are doing is gathering information on these various groups. Mumford said he'd hoped that gathering the information about the lobby groups would have led to a better understanding and a more trusting relationship with them. There's a lot of agenda in the anti-nuclear debate that's not particularly anti-nuclear. It's, it's for a new social order. And the nuclear industry happens to be an easy target because it's perceived to be high-tech, and we don't want high tech, we want small is beautiful. It's seen to be big business. We don't want big business, we want little garden, uh, cottage industries, and so on. Hidden agenda or not, in the summer of 1997, the industry's critics received support from an unexpected direction. Shocking details tonight about Ontario's nuclear power plants. An investigation by the National has... William Farlinger, the, the new chair of the provincial utility, received an independent report on the state of its nuclear plants. The results were shocking. Farlinger spoke out about what he termed the nuclear cult within hydro and the cover-up of a long history of safety problems that were only getting worse. Absolutely. We're, we're... We're, we should be more scared than we were 10 years ago. But according to all the experts, we, we aren't uh, in any danger at the moment, but we're going in the wrong direction. Within weeks, Hydro started closing nuclear reactors. It was a remarkable thing to do, but this was only the prelude to Hydro's announcing a $6.3 billion loss, the largest in Canadian history. We have a tremendous investment in the billions of dollars in 19 nuclear reactors that the people of Ontario uh, have paid for and have relied on for two-thirds of their electricity for uh, well, over, uh, well over a decade and, and certainly a couple of decades in this province. Uh, so we have an asset there that we have to protect on behalf of the shareholders, and the only shareholders in Ontario Hydro are the people of Ontario. So uh, keeping the environmental factors in concern, keeping price in, in uh, in mind, um, I think you're going to see Hydro try and bring back some of its nuclear reactors. One of the problems at Ontario Hydro is that the workers have become sloppy. The managers have become sloppy. Why? Well, I think the reason is very simple to understand. Because they've spent so much energy telling the public and the politicians that this industry is perfectly safe, there's nothing to worry about, that the workers and the managers have begun to believe it. And the thing is, you can't afford to have the workers and the managers believe that this industry is perfectly safe, because it isn't. Ontario Hydro's nuclear program is over 30 years old. Since its beginning, the used uranium fuel has been kept at the reactor sites. What to do with the waste is one of the most contentious issues in the nuclear debate. But burying all of the nuclear waste was never part of the original dream. That's because this used fuel has an amazing property. When a candle is burned, energy is released and very little is left. When uranium is used in a reactor, new elements like plutonium are created. New elements that can be transformed back into fuel and used again. What kind of science can take a fuel, burn it, and turn the ashes back into fresh fuel to burn again? In the United States, the dream of reprocessing fuel has, for now, been abandoned. In Canada, the dream is about to be reborn. To understand what might lie ahead, we only have to look at England's Sellafield nuclear facility, the home of Britain's first reactor, Calder Hall. Like every reactor in use today, it produced plutonium as a byproduct. Plutonium is highly toxic and the key element in making nuclear weapons. That means it's very valuable and a potentially attractive target for terrorists. Here at Sellafield, in a messy and dangerous chemical process, that plutonium is to be removed so it can be made into a new fuel. 
my recycler armor at Sellafield. I'm going to tell you what happens here. We recycle atoms at Sellafield so that most of them can be used over and over again. Here you've come to Sellafield and here you're on a site with world-class skills in nuclear fuel processing which have been acquired over the last 40 years. Uh, reprocessing activities here have been conducted uh, since the 1950s um, and there is that reserve of skill and expertise and experience which has grown up throughout that time. Fuel has been shipped here for almost 30 years. In all that time, almost none of the separated plutonium has been sent back to the countries of origin. And British nuclear fuel would prefer not to ship back waste. Instead, they would like to take the plutonium that was created and mix it with used uranium to generate a new fuel. It's called mixed oxide fuel, or MOX. Sellafield has built an experimental MOX fabrication plant and is in the midst of constructing a full-size factory. It's the first phase of what might be a dramatic renewal of the nuclear industry. What excites scientists is the prospect of making new fuel from old fuel. Like the dream of perpetual motion, it sounds wonderful. But with moths, there are drawbacks. Any fuel that contains separated plutonium is valuable and easily handled, and therefore an attractive target for criminals of all kinds. Nobody has any desire to steal a fuel bundle. Why would you? But when you have plutonium in the fuel, it's a completely different thing. It now becomes a very attractive uh, object for theft. Uh, so that the whole picture changes. Even though physically the, the uh, fuel bundles look the same, they represent an attractive target for people who are looking for money or power or both. It's not only used reactor fuel that contains plutonium that could be made into MOX. MOX fuel has been proposed as a solution for dealing with the world's nuclear arsenal. Weapons that even unused remain a permanent threat of terrorism and accident. The heritage of the Cold War is an enormous stockpile of plutonium. Yet some say it's a win-win situation. Oh, I think the use of box fuels as a means of getting rid of weapons plutonium is a very practical proposition. You know, it's a perfect example of turning swords into plowshares. It's not too difficult to transport separated plutonium, whether from civilian reactors or from weapons. Smugglers, claiming to have plutonium for sale to the highest bidder, have been caught more than once in recent months. Plutonium that has been reused as MOX fuel becomes so dangerous and difficult to handle that it becomes, as they say, self-protecting. What's left out in this argument is that in order to achieve that situation, in which the plutonium is very strongly contaminated, it has to go through several steps in which it's not self-protecting. So one thing that happens is that unprotected plutonium, instead of under secure conditions being held somewhere, heavily guarded, not moved anywhere, until we know exactly what to do with it and what's the best solution to a very difficult problem. Instead of being in that situation, it's being 
removed, stored, processed, transported, moved about, and is present in an unprotecting form in many more places than it was before. The real problem with plutonium is theft. The best way to get something stolen is to spread it around. The more traffic you have in a material, the more likely it is to be stolen. So the worst thing you can do with plutonium is create traffic in it. To have thousands of people handling it, packaging it, transporting it, knowing about the convoys, knowing the transportation routes, this is the wrong thing to do. If you were to use plutonium as the fuel of the future, how would you ever manage to keep this stuff out of the hands of criminals, terrorists, rogue governments, and so on? It would mean that literally every country in the world and all the important criminal organizations and terrorist groups would have access to their own nuclear weapons. Under the banner of Swords into Plowshares, Canada's government has expressed interest in importing plutonium from American and ex-Soviet weapons as mocks and burning it in Canadian reactors. For almost 50 years, the nuclear industry has tried to separate the peaceful atom from its warlike twin. In a strange, ironic twist, this Mox proposal fuses them together again. It establishes a precedent for fabricating fuel containing plutonium and putting it in reactors, then taking additional plutonium that's made while it's in the reactor, taking that out and reprocessing, recycling it, and establishing what people call a plutonium economy. That will automatically increase the proliferation of plutonium considerably. So what is the future for nuclear power in Canada? Will shipments of MOX fuel cross the globe in order to be used in Ontario hydro reactors? That's still uncertain, but the first test shipments are slated for the spring of 1998. Even if the nuclear industry does not foresee selling more reactors here in the near future, each new government seems very keen on selling them abroad. The recent Candu sale to China is being challenged in court for not complying with environmental legislation. And now, Canada is trying to interest Turkey in purchasing a Candu reactor. Nuclear power is the only carbon-free energy source that we have available that could help reduce carbon dioxide emissions over the next two decades at least. So you have to count it in the picture if you're serious about reducing carbon dioxide. Floods, sea level rise, drought and famine are the potential results of climate change caused by our energy use. According to the nuclear industry and its supporters, global warming is the key reason that nuclear power will have to play a much bigger part than it does today in supplying the world's energy. There will be increased pressure on all utilities in North America and throughout the world, but particularly Ontario Hydro. Two-thirds of our hydro is dependent upon those reactors. And uh, the fact of the matter is um, they don't emit greenhouse gases and uh, they don't emit acid rain. So combine the uh, environmental pressures uh, with the financial pressures and uh, um, I think Hydro will be looking very carefully at bringing up seven of the reactors or some of the reactors that are currently down. We say, since we have a greenhouse warming problem, let's look at the most efficient, cost-effective way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, people have done that. Here in Canada, we've had the Royal Society of Canada, which published a major report on greenhouse gases. Guess what? They didn't even mention nuclear power because it's not even in the running. The way to achieve Canada's targets in greenhouse gas reduction, says the Royal Society of Canada, is through energy efficiency. In the 1950s, nuclear power was sold as the only answer to our growing energy needs. In the 1970s, nuclear power was claimed by some to be the only possible response to the oil crisis. Today, nuclear energy has been touted as the only clean alternative to coal, oil and gas. But the industry's critics say we use our energy inefficiently, that we're like someone sitting in a leaking bathtub, 
arguing about what's the best way to get hot water. If they're right, then we don't need a new source of hot water. We need to plug the leaks. And plugging the leaks is cheap and good for the economy. Critics point out that nuclear power is very expensive and that every dollar spent on it means another dollar we don't spend on efficiency. In that sense, every dollar we spend on nuclear power makes our situation worse. If you look to the next century, uh, there's no doubt, and you can ask any energy expert that you like, you will find that the demand for energy is going to increase by a factor of two to three over the next 50 years, and it's mainly in the developing world. And I think nuclear power has to be a part of that. If there's to be any hope for those people in the poor countries, any hope for them to get a standard of living close to ours, and at the same time to have an environmentally sustainable uh, system. And I think that a lot of nuclear scientists really believe this. They really thought that if we could channel this power, we could just make the world a paradise. And along the way, they were so caught up in the dream that they forgot to even check on reality. And the reality is we've got radioactive hulks, we've got billions of dollars in debt, we've got accident potentials that are becoming worse as a result of poor management, sloppy practices, deteriorating equipment, and we also have the ever-present problem of spreading the bomb without really intending to do so. Myths about nuclear power abound. The debate seems endless, but many on both sides hope the bad old days of denials and cover-ups are over. But in Canada, at least, every major player in the nuclear industry turned down our invitation to participate in this program. The AECL, Ontario Hydro, and the Canadian Nuclear Association all refused to be interviewed, to give us access to their sites, or to cooperate with us in any way. The AECB, the industry's regulator, said that they had nothing to add to the discussion. The ministers of the federal government who we invited were also unavailable for comment. Meanwhile, the nuclear industry maintains it is open to scrutiny and interested in public debate. I have been faced with situations where radio and television and newspaper uh, reporters who have a clear record of being hostile to the nuclear industry will try to position the industry in an unfavorable light and in an unfavorable uh, uh, environment for a debate. And uh, I've known of occasions where we have refused to participate simply because the deck was so stacked. It's really reprehensible for a publicly funded corporation like AECL to not to be upfront defending its views in a public forum. I mean, they should be doing that. They should be required to do that. And uh, it's, it's, there's something extremely distasteful about the fact that a crown corporation can behave this way on the one hand, and, but even more importantly, that the elected government can support them in that, in that stance. A public debate about nuclear power would be useful if the objective of both sides is to find a solution. But if the objective of one side is simply to shut it down no matter what, I don't see any basis of a, a productive debate. Right. But I suppose they would respond by saying, well, if the objective of the other side is simply to continue no matter what, how will we have a productive debate? Perhaps you can't have a productive debate between those parties. The future is uncertain. But we do know while major reactor accidents are rare events, they will happen. Perhaps in a thousand years, perhaps tomorrow. What the history of nuclear power teaches us is that industry and government have worked hand in hand developing and selling this technology. If they have their way, it will play a much bigger part in your life than you might imagine. In the absence of informed public debate, who will decide whether the benefits will outweigh the risks?